If you have spent any amount of time on the internet, you probably know what shipping is. You may have discovered what shipping was without even realizing it. Maybe you looked up a character you liked, and then you saw something like this, or this, or this. Well, that's what shipping is. When fans create a relationship dynamic that is different from what the author intended, usually in a romantic way, often making the characters act way differently from the way they act in the canonical lore. The characters don't even have to be from the same universe. It happens in almost every piece of media, whether it's real people, anime, or cartoons. But why is shipping so huge? I mean, it's everywhere! Well, me and a friend of mine who was really into shipping when she was a teenager have come up with a theory why. But to start, I think understanding romantical differences between men and women is key to understanding why shipping is so huge. Men fall in love much differently than women. And since it's mostly women who ship and read romance, I think the psychological and biological differences between men and women is how we must start the analysis. First of all, men tend to fall in love much quicker as opposed to women. From an evolutionary standpoint, women have to be pickier when it comes to picking a partner because of the amount of energy a woman has to expend in the child-making process is far more than the man. So men don't have as much to lose when taking their shot. In pre-modern times, this could mean life or death for the women, since food and protection was not so easily available as it is now. If she picked a bad mate, the consequences would be a lot more dangerous than if a man picked the wrong mate. So biologically, women are designed to be pickier. This is why men are usually first to say I love you in a relationship. I love you, bitch. Since men typically imprint on women quicker because they have less to lose if they fall in love quicker. They tend to be the first to show that they are committed, so the woman becomes comfortable committing to him. Also, men tend to be attracted to physical beauty more than women, so men tend to be the ones to fall in love at first sight, without even determining whether they are compatible or not. It's much different for women. Women care much more about an aesthetic and story, like a certain aura a man radiates rather than the physical characteristics of a man's body. Of course, women very much do care about that. But romance for women usually has a story, and isn't purely about looks, which is why pretty much all romance books are marketed towards women. Twilight, Fifty Shades of Grey, The Fault in Our Stars, etc. Men usually don't care much about story. Men don't read books to fulfill their fantasies. They just open up a tab on the hub and start whacking their hairy gacks. And if there is a story, it's usually something like, Oh no, my sister's best friend got stuck in the dryer and she needs my help. Men and women have on average very different ideals when it comes to romance, which isn't inherently bad or anything. But due to modern circumstances with things like the internet, collapse of natural socializing, and dating apps, the relationship between the genders has gotten really weird, and the love and romance drives increasingly get directed towards stranger and stranger things, as dating conditions go from bad to worse. And a common outlet for women is shipping. When most men make fanfiction, it's not usually about shipping. Men's fanfiction is watching an hour-long video made by some autistic guy on whether Goku can beat Superman, or whether One Punch Man can beat all the Rampa characters. So fanfiction isn't an outlet for romance or lust like it is with women. Men's outlets are subscribing to an OnlyFans girl he pays a monthly subscription for, so he can pretend like he has a girlfriend. Or heading to Xvids for an all-night gooning session. They just want to get to the <laughs> 40 to 70% of men watch adult content at minimum once a week. Anecdotally, I think it's a bit higher, but that's the data I could find. I'm not gonna get into the details of the problems with adult content consumption. There's already a ton of resources for this if you're interested, but here's some good ones. But even if you're not convinced adult content is problematic in itself, I think most will agree that it's like a surrogate girlfriend for men, which implies that the guy would rather be in an actual relationship, but isn't for whatever reason. And with each generation getting lonelier and lonelier, the romance and lust drives get directed into adult content instead of actual relationships, further amplifying the loneliness pandemic. This applies to women as well, although it's not quite as skewed to just adult content. Women usually prefer a mix. They prefer a build-up to the <laughs> which is why 84% of romance readers are women, with women almost twice as likely to even identify themselves as readers as opposed to men. Shipping in fanfiction is most definitely a woman phenomenon. A poll from r slash fanfiction shows that 65% of the people on the sub are women. And with Reddit being about two-thirds men, the numbers are probably skewed. So I think it's fair to say that around 75-80% to 80 of fanfic readers are women. 
Since women don't fall in love as quickly as men do, they're less likely to fall in love at first sight. They need more time to fall in love, so they add much more lore before the actual <laughs> So this is where shipping comes in. Shipping and fanfiction are for women while OnlyFans is for men. It's adding more lore and story to some character they already like and fantasize about. They get the ability to craft their ideal man. They want to create a world outside of the author's control and want to bend these characters to their fantasies and whims, especially when it comes to romance. This is not just a small group of rabid fans doing this. If you go to Wattpad or Webtoon or other fanfiction websites like Archive of Our Own, Fanfiction.net, and Discord Active Roleplaying, they are everywhere, and many of these stories have millions upon millions of reads. They come in all sorts of flavors, between real and fake, wholesome or degrading, sexual and non-sexual, but it's clear why these are written, for the reader to feel like they are in a romantic relationship with their ideal partner. The term shipping is actually pretty new, with the first recorded instances of the word being used in 1995, when fans of the X-Files believe the two main characters, Fox Mulder and Dana Scully, should be in a romantic relationship with each other. But this wasn't the first instance of shipping. Even though there wasn't a word for it, the first big ship happened during the 60s with the original Star Trek. The ship was between its two main male protagonists, Kirk and Spock, with the ship spreading via fan magazines. This was unusual for the 60s, since homosexuality was not nearly as accepted as it is today. I will talk about the prevalence of gay ships later. But since the 60s, shipping has only gotten bigger. At least 100 million people read and write fanfiction. Probably more. I believe the enormous prevalence of shipping in fanfiction comes from today's horrible dating conditions. I think most people would agree that modern dating is absolutely abysmal, both men and women. You have groups like incels complaining that modern women are just narcissistic hypergamous whores, and women complaining that men are just flaky coombrain losers. Or even the groups that are supposedly the most successful, like the stereotypical Chad, are not truly fulfilled with today's dating conditions. This pie chart I got from Pew Research shows that 75% of people are struggling to find people to date and around 67% of people say that their dating life in general just sucks. But anecdotally, I think it's higher for most young people. Academic research is usually a decade or two behind when looking at social problems, so I bet that the dating scene is way worse. But at minimum, two-thirds of the population is struggling in the dating market. But why are so many people unhappy in their dating lives or just completely disenfranchised about romance in general? Well, I believe there are a few reasons. Bad financial conditions don't help, but I don't think that's the biggest factor. I think the most obvious one is the widespread use of dating apps, and also just the internet in general. We have seen significant declines in traditional ways of socializing, things that normally kept communities together, like church, clubs, volunteer groups, etc. A large swath of the population would prefer to watch TV or just use the computer instead, which amplifies social anxiety since you get isolated from your community and lack social practice. So, dating apps have become the normal way for people to meet, but they bring all sorts of problems. When Tinder first came out, most people were extremely skeptical and thought it was kind of pathetic to meet someone in such a forced manner. But now it's become the norm. 50% of Gen Z and Millennials pretty much have to use dating apps to even have a chance to meet someone. Most people are willing to look past physical attractiveness to a few degrees if they already know what the person is like. But unlike dating in most time periods, where you usually knew the person before you actually dated, the modern dating market is the opposite. So less leeway is given when it comes to a person's physical appearance, since that's the only metric you can judge them by on dating apps. Women especially do this. So dating over the past decade or so has become extremely warped. Dating apps have grossly perverted an evolutionary defense mechanism that women have developed over the course of thousands of years, with dire consequences for society as a whole. If Tinder were a country, it would be the second most unequal country in the world, only behind South Africa. With men taking the L, well, on paper they do. This is a pretty well-known statistic, that 80% of the women are attracted to only 20% of the men, so 80% of the men can only choose from 20% of the pool. At that level, there is one woman for every four men. Men when judging a woman's looks have an equal distribution. 
It's a standard bell curve. Kind of disheartening for the boys out there. Like, what are the bottom 80% gonna do? Chad Thundercock is taking all the women, so now I'm just gonna have to watch a VTuber or e-girl to pretend I have a girlfriend. Maybe I should just give up and relegate myself to a life of gooning. Is it because the quality of men is going down? Or is it women developing ridiculous standards? I don't know. Probably a mix of both. Maybe skewed to one side more than the other, but I don't know how much. That's beyond the scope of this video. This disparity is also amplified by the gender demographics. Tinder and most other dating apps are male-dominated. In the United States, Tinder has three men for every one woman. Some dating apps are a little better, but are still usually male-dominated. With women already being naturally pickier than men, this could easily give women the green light to develop extremely unrealistic standards. But do women in the top 20% of guys really have it a whole lot better? On paper they do, but modern dating is terrible even for the groups that seemingly benefit the most. The guys who get all the women often still have trouble finding long-term satisfying relationships. Much of the time, it's just shallow one-night stands or they're in a relationship that's only built on the foundation of sexual pleasure and not love. On a superficial analysis, women seem to have it better when it comes to dating. An average woman on a dating app can easily get 10 matches in a day, while your average dude may get one match in a week. But women are just as unhappy in the dating scene as men, if not more so. According to the Survey Center on American Life, women are less likely to even be interested in dating, and are more likely to only be in a casual relationship. The biggest reason women give is that they have bigger priorities in their life, like pursuing a career so they can make PowerPoint slides for corporate America. The second biggest reason being that they have trouble meeting people, in which 38% of women say this is the biggest factor in why they don't want to date, with women being almost twice as likely to state this as a reason compared to men. So women are having more trouble finding someone who meets their standards. Some of it is definitely the amount of low quality guys out there, but a significant chunk of it is that women have developed pretty arbitrary standards for men. Like if a man makes a good amount of money, but the woman makes more, that's a huge turnoff for many women. But the looks department is at least as important as the financial, especially when it comes to aesthetics. Aesthetics can make or break a relationship for many women. The physical characteristics of a man, like a nice jawline or good muscle definition, is a big bonus. But his style, aesthetics, his aura, whatever you want to call it, has more power than good physical features. There was a study done on a dating app, and they found they had women rating men 1 through 10. Okay. And the women rated 80% of those men as below average. So they rated wow. them under a 5. Wow. So yeah, I stand by that. I feel like I don't find a lot of guys attractive. Um, I don't really know why, I guess. Maybe women are just, like, a little bit more picky when it comes to that or, like, particular. So I feel like I, – I actually think this is why. I think that women have, like, a certain type. So like somebody might be like conventionally attractive, but they just might not be attracted to them because they don't fall into like whatever their specific type is. What makes a man on a dating app physically attractive in your eyes, like in your opinion? Um, physically attractive, um, I like guys that put an effort into their well-being. So like I'm not saying that they have to be like perfect, like Instagram perfect, social media perfect. Um, all day, every day, but you can kind of tell like guys who take care of themselves and guys who just kind of don't really care because then it becomes like a hygiene thing. Like if I see a guy and I can kind of tell he really does not care about, you know, the effort that he puts into how he styles himself or how he dresses himself, then I'm just like, okay, hygienic, what are we doing here? What do I find physically attractive on a dating app of the photo wise? I would say... I like a good backwards hat kind of guy. Okay. Um, he's sporty. He's played some sports maybe, you know. Take care of yourself, you know, your, your brows are cleaned up. If you have facial hair, you know, make sure it's all trimmed and lined up, things of that nature, get a haircut. Just, it's all about the aesthetics. So just to paint a picture here, so say, you know, you're swiping on a dating app and, not, and the <laughs> guy doesn't have those things physically. Like, he's not attractive in the photos. You're not attracted to him. Like, are you swiping left? Because you're not physically attracted to him? Because you're just going off of that. Right. But if, okay, if the person is dressed in a way that I'm attracted to, and if they're, like, they're styled, like, their hair and their facial hair, um, 
then if I don't feel like they're the most attractive person, I'll still swipe right as if I would still swipe right because I like how people carry themselves. I'm really not that into looks. It might seem like it, but I'm really not. Um, because you can you can alter how you look by how you carry yourself, like how your style is. So yeah. But if, if the person didn't, if their style wasn't how I liked or if I felt like they didn't carry themselves in the way that I prefer and they weren't what I would classify as attractive, I would definitely swipe left. When women say they aren't into looks, this is what they mean. It's that physical features like big muscles aren't as important as an aesthetic. Big muscles may add to a certain aesthetic, but big muscles don't add much for women if the guy doesn't have an aesthetic that fits his big muscles. Many women who say they aren't into looks don't realize this, because clearly they do care about looks. Tinder statistics show that they do. What women mean to say is that physical beauty isn't as important as aesthetics. What about some things that men do that make them ugly to women? I don't know, wearing like black pants with a brown belt? Ugh, I would never. So something like that, I'm not too picky. It's like they're with their group of friends and you can tell some of their friends know how to style themselves and they don't. And that immediate comparison, you're just like, okay, he's not as good looking <laughs> as he may think he is. But definitely it comes down to aesthetics. It's styling, it's lighting, it's angles um, on social media. So it's just like knowing how to do those things can definitely make you look 10 times better and then also incorporate that in like your daily life knowing like what looks good on you mm -hmm. um and also like simple things such as haircuts like i think the widespread prevalence of fan fiction and shipping is the manifestation of women's obsession with aesthetics with fan fiction you get to craft the ideal man from the bottom up he can have whatever aesthetic you want him to have dream stands are a perfect example of this dream was a faceless minecraft youtuber whose character looked like this, but his stands turned him into this anime boy aesthetic. They turned this into this, and fleshed out his personality to make him act in a way that fit the anime boy aesthetic they gave him. Even after the face reveal, the fan art didn't change to reflect how he actually looked in real life because they were in love with this aesthetic they wanted him to be. This happens in pretty much every fandom. While Dream has tons of fanfiction surrounding his persona, he doesn't seem all that bothered by it. Probably because Dream is confident in his looks. He posts tons of thirst traps, so he's clearly not insecure about his looks. But there is another YouTuber who has disappeared for some time now that developed imposter syndrome because of these unrealistic expectations, all based on the sound of his voice. Corp's husband started out narrating creepypastas, I've heard of a place out here where I live. It's on one of the back roads of the Alaskan New Growth Forest in one of these valleys. They say that if you drive down this road on a day when the sun is shining so brightly as to make everything appear black and white, then you might come across a girl walking along the side of the road. She is said to be easy to recognize because whether it is summer or winter, she is always wearing a heavy wool overcoat and a set of oversized headphones like those big skull candy headphones you could find in the stores. According to this story, if you drive up alongside her and roll down the window, you might hear her singing. The song some people around here say is Rizzo Cerez's Gloomy Sunday. But really started to take off after playing Among Us with Twitch streamers. He is also very successful in the music industry. His music evoked a mysterious bad boy aesthetic. The most popular one is titled E-Girls Are Ruining My Life, with lyrics talking about choking girls out and them liking it. And his fans loved it, because the lyrics were sung by a man with an extremely attractive voice. Choke me like you hate me, but you love me, low-key wanna date me when you fuck me, touch me with the lights off and my chains on. Two years ago, he took a hiatus from the internet. He now only posts music. He will probably never go back to streaming. According to this Dexerto article, the reason Corp's husband has stated for his lack of streaming is due to the pressure he felt in entertaining thousands of people on stream. Corp's opened up about it more while talking to Iron Mouse. He revealed that during every stream, he would be shaking the whole time. And it got to a point where he said, 
yeah, I don't really think I enjoy doing this. He started to hate streaming because of the immense pressure he felt he had to live up to due to the high expectations his audience placed on him. All of these expectations were set because he had a very deep and resonant voice. Fangirls crafted a whole character and aesthetic almost solely based on his voice. Women are very sensitive to a deep voice. They remember deep voices more than they do average ones. And Corpse had an incredibly distinct voice, so their idea of him was set at an extremely high bar. A sexy voice must mean every part of him is sexy, right? So the fans' imaginations went wild. During an Instagram Q&A, one of Corpse's husband's fans asked him, What's the main reason why you won't be doing a face reveal? Corpse's answer to the question uncovered a lot more about the YouTuber than most previously knew. Realistically, it'll happen. Inevitably. Against my will, Corpse said. A lot of people think it's like a business thing or a gimmick. I just deeply effing hate my face. And people's expectations at this point are ridiculous and unachievable. It came to the point where people were going through his social media and doxed where he may live. There is a supposed face reveal out there, but it is still unknown if it really is Corpse. But it probably is. There were so many pissed off fangirls whose expectations weren't met. They were sorely disappointed that he didn't look like Zeus as a cat boy. To be fair, Corpse did egg on this sort of mysterious bad boy aesthetic, but I don't think he realized that he was watering the seeds that would grow into fans this crazy. Fans who designed one of the most elaborate doxing plans ever crafted. Women are focused on looks and very focused on the idea of what their ideal man should look like, and often fall in love with the persona they want him to have. So, if the person doesn't live up to their expectations, it can be devastating because of the amount of emotional energy they sink into these parasocial relationships. Creating a false persona around a celebrity or fictional character to match the author's romantical tastes. The persona they give these characters can create an intense and enduring emotional attachment, love, infatuation, or desire for a fictional character. Psychologists call this fictophilia. It's essentially a parasocial relationship with a fictional character. People who suffer from fictophilia realize these characters aren't real and know they can't reciprocate back often creating a sense of sadness and discomfort. But regardless, they still feel a deep emotional connection to these characters. Even though they know it's not real, they feel like they get real emotional support, just like any other parasocial relationship. Shipping and other types of fanfiction especially attract people with attachment anxiety. This study showed that people with attachment anxiety form stronger parasocial bonds. Some people even prefer fictional people over real people. Fictional characters can be whatever you want them to be. They can have every quality that attracts you, and you have no worries of rejection or disloyalty like a real relationship. Many people are so lonely and anxiety-ridden, they have to cling on to fictional characters just to cope. The friend of mine who inspired me to make this video gave me tons of insights. She was really into shipping as a teenager, so she knows what Ground Zero is like. She even had a Wattpad story with 400,000 views. She wants to remain anonymous, but from her years of experience, she has come up with what she thinks are the main archetypes women fawn over. There are a ton of other archetypes. I know a girl who's into the chubby guys with man buns archetype. But she's a minority. Most women have a preference for these three archetypes. You have the clean-cut muscular guy, the more traditionally masculine man, a stereotypical Chad. Tall, strong, confident, competent, hot, and stylish, but also able to be emotional. In the early 2010s, it was boy bands like One Direction or Big Time Rush. Popular ones today include people like Chris Hemsworth and Henry Cavill. I think the Markiplier and Jacksepticeye ship that was popular in the mid-2010s would also fit this category. A ship that made the two guys really uncomfortable. Sam the Player is a weird thing, because it started off as me and Mark just being good friends. And then it was kind of just like a buddy-buddy kind of thing, and we were all happy and everything. And then people took it way too fucking far. Um, it, it was just a case of, like, the whole the homosexual side of Scepter Plier that kind of got a bit out of control. And then even when me and Mark had said, like, please don't do that. We're like, we don't mind Scepter Plier, but please don't draw us like fucking each other. 
Then people went ahead anyway, and they're like, oh, but it's so cute, look! Like, <laughs> that was directly going against what we had said. Like... I think books like Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey express this archetype. And by the way, Fifty Shades of Grey is literally just a fanfiction of Twilight. It's the standard hot guy aesthetic. The second main archetype are the pretty boys. This consists of K-pop bands, emo boys, e-boys, lots of anime characters. Characters like Deku from My Hero Academia being shipped with literally Popeyes. anyone. Do you want a bite of my chicken breast? Here puppy, I know you haven't eaten today. Take a bite. Here, I'll help. Watch me. Mmm, mm, puppy. This chicken's bussin'. Dream stands turning this average looking guy into a pretty boy since it's their favorite aesthetic. It's pretty standard yaoi stuff. Many women idolize men who are in tune with their emotions and have feminine physical traits, but at the same time want them to behave in a more masculine way, especially in the bedroom. They're usually super skinny, have long or longish black hair, painted nails, mysterious, brooding, and serious. My friend called it the woman's dilemma. It's paradoxical that the woman wants a man who is feminine, but also masculine at the same time. This is the quintessential anime aesthetic. Quick side note, this aesthetic is all about the hair. K-pop stars with different haircuts just turn into normal Korean dudes. They instantly lose that pretty boy look. If you're trying to go for the pretty boy aesthetic, you first and foremost need to focus on your hair. Now we get to the suave, affluent, older Victorian man. This archetype especially attracts girls with daddy issues. There is usually one or two characters in most fandoms that have this Victorian aesthetic. They often have dark triad traits and are very masculine. He is poetic, mysterious, very well groomed, sophisticated, a provider, a gentleman, but also dominating. Often borderline evil. Like the devil just walked out of a men's warehouse. Characters like Jack Skellington from Nightmare Before Christmas and Victor Von Dart from Corpse Bride, CL and Sebastian from Black Butler, the Bill Cipher and Dipper Ship from Gravity Falls, Olaf and Violet from Series of Unfortunate Events, and this one YouTube video called The Night. I think this video encapsulates this archetype perfectly. The comments are really telling. It's a video about this girl going into an abandoned mansion, and a tall, lanky vampire man comes out to try and seduce her, getting way too handsy with her. But at the end, she's able to kill him and take his powers. It's a very high quality animation. Daria Cohen did a great job, don't get me wrong. But I don't think the pretty animation is why it has over 50 million views. Many of the top comments are disavowing the vampire guy's actions, which I very much agree with. On a rational level, I think most of its viewers agree. There are some comments that don't hide their fantasies, but most say it's wrong. The high quality of the animation is great, but I think this video blew up because this is a common fantasy for women. The tall, suave man, who in this case is a vampire, which is a very popular romance trope, is hitting on this girl while also showing these sort of dark triad traits. It's the suave, bad boy aesthetic, which women love. Just read Twilight or Fifty Shades of Grey, or any other similar fantasy. Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey is the writing equivalent of a shitty diaper smoothie, but the authors know exactly what women want, so they sold really well regardless. You might have noticed the prevalence of huge age gap ships in this category. Like the Bill Cipher and Dipper ship from Gravity Falls, called Bill Dip, which was the most popular ship in the fandom. Dipper is only 12 years old, and he's being shipped with a billion year old demon. The CL and Sebastian ship from Black Butler, CL is also 12, and Sebastian is several hundred years old. There is also a weird amount of shipping and series of unfortunate events between Olaf and Violet. Count Olaf is 50, and Violet is 14. Olaf in the books is described as ugly and unkempt, and he's a complete dickhead, yet people still ship them. Probably because he's old and rich, but fangirls redraw him to fit this Victorian aesthetic, even though canonically he's not. This is why we think this archetype is much more popular with girls who have daddy issues, which there are a lot of. Ugh, my browsing history looks so suspicious. I'm using the tamest images I could find, and they're still pretty bad. I'm, I'm probably on a watch list now. 
we assume that most of the people who ship these huge age gap relationships are teenagers themselves, and the underage character is a self-insert. I don't think it's the work of pedos, for, for the most part. It's mostly girls with daddy issues. To be honest, I couldn't find any hard evidence, but it seems generally agreed upon that girls with daddy issues tend to be attracted to men a lot older than themselves. The affluent, competent Victorian man is more like a father figure than, let's say, the pretty boy archetype. So instead of going for boys that are around her own age, like most, these girls want some sort of replacement for a father they never had. Hence, why they want a man who is more protective, wealthy, dominating, etc. So, we think it's fair to say this archetype attracts girls with daddy issues. With most people being terribly unhappy with the current dating market, people will completely immerse themselves in these fantasies. These ridiculous standards of how the opposite gender is supposed to act and look being perpetrated by media is being psychologically enforced as the coping mechanisms for loneliness, while also making the population, especially women, attracted to the outlier man, the fantasy, while in reality, most people are in the middle of the bell curve and therefore become unattractive. It's similar to men watching VTubers or e-girls, watching an almost caricature of how women act. These VTubers try to embody a fantasy of how these men would want their girlfriends to act, but in real life, very few women act that purely feminine. I want to go back to the original Star Trek ship. If you didn't notice, it was between two men. This was unusual for the 60s, since homosexuality was not nearly as accepted as it is today. But it wasn't gay men doing the shipping. It was women. In the article, The Science Behind Shipping by Maggie Owens, she goes over a history of popular ships and offers some insights about why people ship and how far back it's gone. But the thing that stuck out to me in the article is that all the examples except one were male on male, and not a single lesbian ship. Most of the shipping examples I've shown are between two men. If you didn't know anything about shipping before watching, this may come off as kind of weird. Why are almost all ships gay? Trust me, this was just as confusing for me too. It's all men, like really. It has to be like 75% of the ships, or at the very least, it's way out of proportion to what it should be with gay men being only a small minority of romance readers. Romance books sold at stores seem to be mainly between men and women, but nearly every online fanfiction made by fans from an established media is male on male. Since most of the readers and writers are women, I would have thought most fanfiction would be between men and women, since the woman character would be an easy self-insert, but that's not the case. Shipping is so often between males, I think it needs a deep dive. So I went to the smartest places on the internet, Reddit and Quora, and they put forth a couple of ideas. Some said that it's the same reason why men like lesbian adult content. Two people of the opposite sex that they are attracted to doing the eh, eh, eh. They see all the parts they enjoy and none that they don't. It's a win-win. I think this argument could work with straight women, but this doesn't explain why lesbians also love gay fanfiction. Some theories for this were that they were either secretly straight or a closeted trans. Also, it's a common complaint from women that female characters just aren't as interesting as the male characters, so they prefer to ship the males. I think that's ridiculous. You guys can disagree with me in the comments, but I've never found a lack of good women characters in media. Nobara from Jujutsu Kaisen, Power from Chainsaw Man, Mikasa from Attack on Titan, sorry, I almost only watch anime. Maybe most other medias are worse when it comes to women characters, I don't know, but I've rarely been disappointed by the lack of good female characters. Some also say gay fanfiction is so popular because there's not enough gay erotica in the mainstream, so gay fanfiction is a great place to go for LGBT people. That's probably true for gay men who read fanfiction, but again, it's mostly women who read and write this stuff, and the vast majority of women are straight, so you think it would be mostly straight ships. I think there's a different reason. I believe it mostly stems from the writers and readers insecurities. The reason many women don't like to read and write about straight couples is because they don't want to see the men they love with another female. Women in general tend to be more jealous when they see men in relationships with other women. So when women aren't involved in a ship, the jealousy impulse starts to fade. If it's two men, the insecurity that she is not good enough disappears because, well, they're gay, so she's not even an option. 
She doesn't feel like she is watching a straight relationship she wishes she could have from afar. Since it's two men, it's just some perverted fantasy she can watch without being jealous of other women. I would like to support this claim with a study conducted by a PhD student in experimental psychology at the University of Texas in Arlington. Russell's theory is that gay males are a safe bet when a woman befriends them. At first glance, this explanation may seem quite counterintuitive. After all, straight women and gay men don't mate with one another. However, this is precisely the reasoning behind my approach. Because gay men don't mate with women or compete with them for mates, women feel a certain level of comfort with gay men, and the process of forming a close friendship can occur relatively quickly. With heterosexual men, who by definition are sexually attracted to women, the process is longer and potentially more fraught, because men may be grappling with their own sexual impulses. In other words, because gay men are attracted to their own gender, they're a safe bet for women, at least from a socio-biological standpoint. Women trust dating and romance advice from gay men more than straight men or women, since gay men don't have an ulterior motive. The straight man may give a different response to try and woo her, and women don't trust other women because they are seen as competition. I think a similar phenomenon happens with gay shipping. If they were shipping their favorite male characters with a girl, they might see her as competition. So she makes her favorite character gay, since now she won't feel jealous that the man she loves is with another girl. She could fantasize without feeling insecure by a lack of confidence that she could ever get in a relationship like the ones she fantasizes about. Since a woman has no chance with a gay dude, she feels no insecurity. She doesn't have to worry about competition from another woman. He is now more akin to a friend than a love interest. So she is comfortable about this character she likes being with another man, and can fantasize from the sidelines without feeling jealous or unworthy. But this can lead to many problems between women and gay men. It's not uncommon for gay guys to complain that women think of them as an accessory in their friend group and only care about them for dating-related advice. But gay fanfiction leads to another problem, the fetishization of gay relationships. I think a comment from an actual gay guy would be better than my own thoughts. And this comment from Quora on a post asking about how gay guys feel about women being the main writers of gay erotica by Chad Renton sums it up nicely. The trend toward women consuming and producing gay erotica makes an entirely different product. He says, it's no longer for us gay men. When I read homoerotic fiction written by women, I get something different than when it comes from gay men. This is true even when the pseudonym of the author is ambiguous. There's something about the romance that seems different than how men typically operate. I feel completely tricked. This is not the fiction I want to consume. When a man writes it, it feels correct. The psych, the emotions, physical feelings, the push-slash-pull of masculinity, all of that feels right when a gay man writes gay erotic fiction. The same holds true of all gay fiction, homoerotic or not. Whether we like it or not, men operate subtly different than women do when it comes to relationships. Our parts also work differently. He ended by saying, Women do not live our lives. They do not know our lives and can never know our lives. This is tantamount, in my view, to true cultural appropriation in the worst sense. Women cannot control our narrative the way we can, and they cannot give a true view into our sensibilities, whether emotional or physical. Gay fanfiction written by women cannot convey how actual gay relationships operate. Gay fanfiction is written for women, and written in ways that appeal to women's fantasies, not gay men's. This made me think, how would women feel if men wrote lesbian erotica and described their anatomy in a way that is not accurate while also hypersexualizing them? And imagine that being most of the erotica written for lesbians. The whole country would be on lockdown, riots in the streets, businesses closed, police in full riot gear. I think shipping tells a lot about how lonely we have become. We live our lives on the internet, shacked up in our houses, dubbed the loneliest generation. It is a primal instinct to seek out a mate and want friends. So instead of being successful with these biological goals in real life, we live it vicariously through these imagined characters. Writing can be self-therapy, but it can also reveal the insecurities, fantasies, and the deep desires of the writers and readers, whether they're consciously aware of it or not. And I think the mass prevalence of shipping and fanfiction in general is the manifestation of modern loneliness.
The professor of philosophical psychology at Antwerp sums up what the prevalence of shipping tells us about our current social conditions in his article, The Psychology of Shipping. Shipping reveals a lot about our society and about just how lonely and unloved people often feel. It is this loneliness that feels the need to experience romance and love, at least vicariously. And what better way is there to do so than shipping?